Uh, my name is Jacob White. We'll go ahead and get started with uh, today's session. Uh, I am welcoming you on behalf of the Southeast Hub of the Ohio STEM Learning Network, where uh, we aim to share STEM resources and opportunity for partnership uh, development more broadly in an effort to support STEM education uh, across the state and specific interest in supporting STEM education in the Southeast region. Uh, I work for the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Services at Ohio University. Uh, and I have uh, put together a three-part webinar series uh, offered this year. These sessions are incongruent. Uh, they're not connected uh, to one another. So they're three separate standalone sessions. These are being archived and you'll have a link to these uh, along with your certificates of attendance that are mailed to you uh, afterwards. Today's agenda and the session uh, today will focus on simulated science experiments. I'll uh, briefly explain what that concept means what the benefits are uh, in terms of uh, student learning and pedagogical approaches. Uh, I'll spend most of the time presenting to you a sample lesson plan that I developed uh, for simulating a particular experimental approach. The concept is quite simple, uh, which allows it to be very easily adaptable uh, to different grade levels, different content topics, uh, but I'll be presenting it uh, with a specific um, scenario in, in mind. I'll also be sharing a link to a full lesson plan associated with this concept, uh, as well as student handouts and supplemental resources uh, as well. As I said uh, earlier, there will be time for connecting with your peers, uh, conversation and question and answer uh, in breakout rooms. When we consider science experiments, why would you consider incorporating science experiments within your uh, classroom curriculum? Well, in short, uh, experimentation is a learning expectation articulated in the state science standards. Uh, this is housed within the nature of science uh, content section of the standards. Uh, what I have shown here is pertaining to the K-2 grade band curriculum for science. This is also found uh, in all other grade bands, K through 12, uh, listed here that students are expected to develop the ability to apply scientific inquiry and practice. Uh, specifically, students are expected to be able to plan and conduct uh, scientific investigations using appropriate safety techniques, and employ uh, simple equipment and tools to gather the data, extend senses, and apply mathematical thinking uh, to construct reasonable uh, explanations. This is articulated in the K-2 standards. Uh, this applies more broadly throughout uh, K-12 with expectations um, uh, increasing in complexity in terms of uh, experimental abilities. Incorporating science experiments within your curriculum uh, will essentially allow students the opportunity to practice doing science. Uh, that can involve practice taking measurements, uh, using measured values in subsequent calculations, analyzing data, uh, developing data visualizations, and sharing data or conclusions that were based on data uh, communicating and sharing those uh, with others. Uh, it might be helpful to consider if you're uh, planning experimentation uh, to consider it within the context of the scientific method and to consider tailoring uh, your activities or, or your approach, such as to target only specific steps in the scientific method. Uh, here I have summarized uh, as uh, making observations and formulating a hypothesis, then planning and conducting an experiment that will test the hypothesis. Afterwards, analyzing results and drawing evidence-based conclusions, and then finally communicating the results uh, and the experiment itself uh, to, to others. I'm summarizing these into four broad steps, you've probably seen the scientific method articulated 
uh, more granularly uh, with additional steps. Uh, I'm summarizing here more broadly in, in these four. Uh, for example, it may be a benefit for you to consider uh, providing students with a preset uh, observation, a hypothesis based on the observation, and an experimental plan, providing all of that to students, but then challenging students to actually conduct the experiment and focus the activity and the practice that you're giving uh, students um, on analyzing the results and communicating their conclusions. It may be beneficial to consider uh, structuring experimental uh, experiences for students that is not an, uh, a, an, a holistic approach in terms of giving students full reign uh, of applying the scientific method in all of its components. Uh, perhaps uh, it can be more effective to target just specific steps of the scientific method. Regardless uh, of uh, the type of experiment, there are certainly in intended benefits. What I want to uh, differentiate today uh, is a comparison of real or authentic experiments in comparison with simulated experiments. And uh, we'll focus on, on the latter of those two. An example of what I mean by an authentic or a real uh, science experiment might be understood as a traditional density experiment in a science classroom, where uh, density is calculated by taking the mass of a substance and dividing it by the volume uh, of that substance, mass divided by volume. Students are often tasked with conducting density experiments in the classroom where they may uh, aim to determine the identity uh, of a solid substance, such as a metal, by measuring its density and comparing with a known value. Another common approach to this type of traditional experiment uh, is figuring out how to determine the density of a liquid. Uh, that could be challenging. Um, how do you measure the mass of a liquid? Um, uh, that can be a, a unique approach uh, that, that students grapple with in terms of selecting appropriate uh, measurement tools. Another common traditional density experiment uh, may be determining the relationship of flotation with respect to density. So if you take a uh, substance and place it in a liquid, whether it floats, sinks, or is suspended is relevant to the uh, density comparison. These are all uh, examples of authentic real classroom experiments where students are working with uh, real materials, they're taking their own measurements, and they're drawing conclusions based on, uh, based on their experimental results. There are benefits to learning associated with allowing students to conduct real experiments in the classroom. Some benefits might include experience using uh, instrumentation, taking measurements with instruments, uh, using those measured values in subsequent calculations, uh, being able to identify the correct mathematical models that are applicable to an experiment. For example, in a density experiment, uh, being able to use the correct equation, mass divided by volume. Uh, this type of approach gives students uh, the opportunity to practice that mathematical modeling. And then also data analysis. If students repeat their measurements, uh, were their measured values reproducible? Uh, was there any variation in their results? Um, students can uh, gain practice in analyzing data through authentic experimentation. Uh, there are very clear learning benefits. However, there are potential drawbacks in terms of conducting authentic real experiments in the classroom uh, setting. Some experiments pose safety concerns uh, that simply prohibit the opportunity, uh, or there may be safety concerns that can be limited but still present if authentic uh, experimentation is, is being planned or, or conducted. Uh, that's one potential drawback to real experiments. Another potential drawback is anomalous results. Uh, experiments are open to uh, any, any possible set of results. You can have randomness in real experimentation. 
uh, leading to anomalies in, in results. That can be difficult for students to, uh, to wrestle with, uh, to reconcile in their conclusions uh, and so forth. Another potential drawback to authentic experiments is if a procedure is scripted, very detailed, uh, what can often happen is students participate simply in confirmation uh, of a scientific principle uh, or, or concept. They simply follow steps, obtain expected results, and in doing so, confirm something that has been uh, predetermined or, or expected. Uh, that can limit learning opportunities and uh, pose a potential drawback. In contrast to what I'm describing as authentic or real classroom science experiments, we see an emergence of what are called simulated science experiments. Uh, now I'm trusting many of you likely have experience using some type of uh, science simulator or simulated experiment in your curriculum particularly over the last uh, year and a half to two years when uh, remote learning uh, has increased in, in prevalence. Uh, what I mean for today by a simulated science experiment is simply not authentic. It's not real. Something is artificial or fake about it. It's pretend. Something has, has been developed uh, that takes away its, its authenticity. Uh, simulated science experiments are often models that are used to represent theory, and they're very clean models, meaning they weed out opportunities for other influences, uh, making for, for uh, very limited results and limited uh, interaction. Uh, probably most frequently, simulated science experiments are virtual. They're computer-based. Uh, they can often be uh, gaming-like. Uh, gaming platforms. Um, and in addition to that, and an example that I'll, I'll show today, experiments can be simulated uh, simply by using fake data uh, or structured in a manner that uh, predetermines the data that will be generated by, by the experiment. With respect to uh, constructing a simulated experiment for a classroom setting, there are also uh, potential benefits to taking this approach. One, uh, they can uh, be structured as to provide increased safety uh, or to be more safe in comparison with some uh, authentic or real experimental uh, scenarios. Uh, simulated science experiments could be structured to generate less waste. Um, they can often be far, far more affordable allowing students to repeat uh, uh, experimental trials infinitely in some cases without incurring additional cost. Uh, they can be structured as to prevent the possibility of anomalous results. So they can be structured so that only preset results are going to be generated by students. Um, that can simplify uh, conclusions that, that students are likely to draw from, uh, from results. And simulated experiments uh, often can be customizable. Uh, I'm going to present uh, an example of a simulated experiment that I developed today that uh, is simple in concept and uh, hopefully uh, gives you some ideas for how you could customize the approach for your own, uh, for your own classroom. I want to pause for just a moment and ask uh, those of you who are joining today uh, to participate in the first poll. Uh, Mackenzie, could you please launch poll number one? I'm just curious, uh, those of you who are connecting today, what's your level of experience in using any type of experiment simulation, whether it's a virtual uh, simulator, whether it's just using fake data, uh, or a pretend experiment in your classroom? Um, just curious, what, what is your level of experience? Okay, the results are coming in. Give you just a moment to complete. Okay, we'll wrap it up. So it looks as if collectively, um, 
uh, most of you have some experience using simulated uh, experiments in your classroom. Fantastic. I'm going to ask for you to share uh, some of the simulations that you use uh, here in, in just a moment. Uh, let's see if I can share these results. Uh, so if you hopefully you see on the screen these results. And uh, again, your response is not identified uh, in the aggregate here that's being shared. There's another poll coming up that I, I want your participation in. And please be aware your answer will not be identified or linked back to you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so first, I want to share with you an example of a virtual simulated uh, experimental platform that I'm familiar with. I have heard uh, many, many teachers who have used this platform across the grade bands, elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, teachers have used this platform, have had a lot of success. It has a lot of uh, good um, functionality to it, and it was developed at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, this uh, simulation platform is FET, P-H-E-T. It's a freely available platform. Uh, it uses HTML5 um, uh, functionality, which, which means it's freely av available. If you have internet access, that's all you need. You go to the website, click on a simulation, and it runs, uh, runs the simulation uh, automatically. Uh, this system was developed by a uh, Nobel laureate. Uh, there are 91 simulations available in, uh, in their system. Uh, these uh, are virtual, they're, they're online, and they're developed to be very game-like uh, in their structure uh, and appearance um, with the, uh, the intention of, of being uh, of interest and fun for, for students to access and, and engage in. These simulations uh, are separated within the content areas of uh, physics, chemistry, earth science, and biology. Uh, there are multiple simulations within each of those content areas. And there are simulations that are designed uh, to be applicable for elementary grades, uh, middle school grades, high school grades, and there are also university level uh, simulators. I have a link uh, shared here to the website you can access. Um, and again, these are freely available. And I have heard from many uh, teachers who have had success using this platform. Uh, this is what it looks like. When you go to the website, you can search for simulations uh, based on subject area. Uh, so here, physics and uh, subtopics uh, are listed. Uh, just as an example, I chose biology and uh, found six different simulations. You can also search by grade level, compatibility, uh, access and inclusion uh, as well. You can also sort by uh, keyword search. Uh, I want to show what one of these simulations looks like. Uh, this is a pH scale. So if you click on that pH scale uh, simulation, you have a few options. Uh, this is one of them. This is uh, referred to as a macro scale version of the simulator. It just brings up um, uh, in contrast to, I believe they have a micro scale pH simulator, which focuses on the uh, molecular level and what molecules look like and, uh, and are interacting with. Uh, this is the pH simulator on the FET system. Uh, this has a draggable sensor uh, that I have highlighted here uh, that measures pH. You can drag that sensor uh, around and for this simulator, drag it into a solution and it will measure the pH of the solution that it is placed in. Now notice at the top of this simulator, uh, there is a drop down uh, window that says battery acid. It actually has, I think 10 or 11 different solutions that you can choose from and you can begin adding those solutions to the container while measuring the pH. Uh, this simulator allows for you to drain the container. It allows for you to add water selectively. And as an example of a, an experiment uh, that students could use a simulator for, uh, experiments require manipulating variables and, and repeating through multiple trials you could consider uh, students might be tasked with planning and conducting an experiment to determine if there's a relationship 
between the pH of two separate liquids compared with the pH of the mixture when the two liquids are combined. Now, with students, would have a lot of flexibility in designing uh, how to take measurements, uh, conducting the experiment where they manipulate variables, they choose different uh, substances to mix together, they can choose different volumes to mix together and measure the pH uh, while engaging in those uh, varied trials. This is just one example, and I only have a screenshot with my snippet tool uh, not showing the interactive motion component to this platform. Just wanna show an example of, of this simulation. A second example from FET, uh, and again, this platform has 91 uh, simulations uh, available on it. Another example is called a skate park. Uh, this is an energy simulator that allows students to explore relationships uh, between kinetic energy, potential energy, speed, mass, and friction. Um, there may also be an opportunity and a, a variation of this simulator to also manipulate temperature uh, within. Uh, similar to the previous simulator, there's a measuring tool, I'll have it highlighted here, that you can drag to different locations and take measurements. This tool allows for measurement of kinetic energy, uh, potential energy, thermal energy, and then collectively the total amount of energy. Uh, students might use this simulator uh, to engage in an experiment where they're tasked with planning and conducting an experiment to determine the effect of friction on the skater's maximum kinetic energy. Uh, the simulation allows for manipulating vari variables in an experimental manner. Uh, now notice on the right side of this screen, uh, there are slider bars where you can adjust how much friction is applied to the skater's wheels in contact with the ramp. Uh, you can adjust the strength of gravity being applied. You can adjust the amount of mass uh, for the skater and then take measurements and see how those variables influence the measurements being taken. Uh, these are examples of virtual simulations. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, explore FET. Uh, if you do not have experience uh, with the FET platform, uh, I have heard nothing but uh, positive comments from teachers, and I have been quite impressed with the uh, simulations that I have explored and, uh, and incorporated. Uh, these are examples of virtual simulations. I now want to uh, share with you an example of a non-virtual simulated experiment. Uh, this can be thought of as a, a hands-on activity. It's not virtual, it's not online. It's something that you could do in your classroom with your students, real time, real space. Uh, it is simulated, so there are aspects where it, it's essentially a fake experiment, uh, but students don't know that. Uh, it is presented as if it is an authentic experiment, uh, and it's quite engaging. Uh, this lesson plan um, was, was developed uh, with several colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. John Means and Tim Hall at the University of Rio Grande, and Dr. Denise Shockley uh, at the Gallia Vinton Educational Service Center. We published this lesson plan in the Science Teacher, uh, which is the flagship journal of the National Science Teacher Association. Uh, within that publication, you can access the full lesson plan, student handouts, and uh, quite a few additional supplemental resources. And I'll be sharing a link if you want access to, uh, to all of those materials. For today, I'm gonna to present a very pared down version of this lesson plan uh, and the concept uh, just to spur your creative uh, ideas for how you might take this concept, develop your own lesson, um, and, and make it your own. Uh, it's a simple concept that's easily to adapt. If you want to adopt the full lesson plans that are developed, I have a link where you can access those, uh, those as well. I would also say because this is hands-on and not virtual, what I have found is that students are so engaged. It may be more vintage at this point, because of online remote learning uh, gaming platforms that students are becoming very, very familiar with. 
uh, these types of hands-on, real-time, real space opportunities um, may not be as prevalent uh, as, as they once were. So here's the idea, the big lesson concept. We're going to conduct an experiment to test a watershed for possible source of contamination. And the idea is you begin by creating your own map. That map can be as simple or complex as you want it to be. Here's a pretty simple map of a river or a creek. Please don't make fun of my uh, artistic limitations. Uh, this represents a, a river or a creek and students uh, are okay with this representation of a river or a creek. In the bend of this creek, uh, I have a star placed next to the map, and that star represents a location of a newly discovered site that is suspected of releasing contamination into this watershed. It could be a dump site that was discovered. Maybe there was construction occurring and an excavation um, discovered uh, buried uh, contamination. And we're gonna test this watershed to see if that site is actually releasing contamination uh, into the waterway. Within this creek, the current flows from north to south. That's gonna be important uh, for formulating a hypothesis. So if we have this creek and the current is flowing from north to south and a location that may be releasing contamination into the water is right in that bend, uh, indicated by the star, we can conduct an experiment by collecting fish throughout that creek, both upstream and downstream. And we're going to screen those fish samples for the presence of contamination. On this map, the collection sites are numbered. We have eight collection sites in this version uh, of the lesson plan. Sites one, two, three, and four are downstream of the suspected source of contamination. Sites five, six, seven, and eight are upstream of the suspected uh, site releasing contamination. So I'm going to pause and ask for each of you to please participate in the next uh, poll. Mackenzie, could you please launch poll number two? Which of the following hypotheses do you agree with most? If that newly discovered site is actually leaking contamination into the stream, then which of the following do you agree with? Would you predict that all of the fish caught will be contaminated? None of the fish caught will be contaminated? Most of the fish caught will be contaminated? All of the fish downstream will be contaminated, none of them upstream will, or most of the fish downstream will be contaminated. Most of the fish upstream will not. I see the results are coming in. Give you just a few more moments to think through these options. And hopefully this scenario is, is simple enough to understand the concept of, of the lesson. Just formulating a hypothesis uh, has led to such rich conversations with students. Um, this has been a very engaging uh, activity with, with students. Okay, give you just another second. I think the final results are coming in. Okay, Mackenzie, could you please end the poll and share the results? Okay, we see uh, everyone has uh, selected an option towards the bottom of the list. Uh, so most fish caught will be contaminated. Uh, some thought that all of the fish downstream will be contaminated, none of them upstream will. Uh, most of you selected the last hypothesis, which is that we would predict most of the fish caught downstream will be contaminated most of the fish caught upstream will not be contaminated. Okay, thank you for participating. I'm now going to walk you through the experiment, uh, show you uh, some of the re results that I have built into the lesson, uh, and then 
open it up for, uh, for conversation. Uh, so here's the scenario. You make a map. Uh, you create a story to go along with it. And we're going to measure or screen for contamination in fish that were caught across this, uh, this creek, this water body. This is what the experiment looks like. So we have fish samples uh, collected here. I have them placed in bags. See a small piece of fish to the left. Small samples of fish, one piece per bag. Each bag is labeled with the collection site number. Uh, so here we have a sample that was collected at site number one. I also have it labeled by species. That's not relevant to the experiment uh, for, for this purpose. Uh, it's simply used to suggest authenticity. Students see it and it's labeled number one catfish adds to the sense of authenticity. And then we also use a contamination test solution, which is simply screening for the presence of contamination. And the way it is tested is by simply opening the bag that has the fish sample, adding a couple drops of the test solution, and we look for a color change. No color change is recorded as evidence that contamination was not detected. If a color change occurs, it will be immediate and it will be obvious. And that will be recorded as evidence that contamination was detected uh, in that site. We see the sample on the right uh, turns a bright pink color. Uh, that is indicating uh, the presence of contamination in that, uh, in that particular sample. So if we conduct this experiment, and I'll explain what the samples are and the test solutions, um, it's very simple to construct, very simple to prepare, and very engaging. Uh, the materials that are needed, uh, personal protective equipment, safety glasses and gloves, the materials are not particularly hazardous, uh, but safety practices should be in place. Uh, you simply buy frozen fish fillets from a grocer. A uh, $5 bag of uh, fish fillets will generate about a hundred. If you cut them into smaller pieces, you could get uh, more, more than that. And then uh, small resealable plastic bags uh, to put the samples in. There are two chemicals that are needed for, uh, for this procedure as it is structured. Sodium hydroxide is a base. Um, really any base will work for, for this purpose. The sodium hydroxide solution could be bought uh, through many vendors. Uh, I priced them earlier this week, a $15 bottle will probably last a lifetime for, for using this experiment. Uh, in addition, a separate solution called phenolphthalene, uh, which is funny to say, it's very hard to spell. Uh, it is an acid-base indicator solution. Students will be working with very small amounts of that solution. That is actually the solution placed in the bottle that's labeled contamination test solution. And small dropper bottles. These are all of the needed materials. As a startup cost, all of these collectively uh, will require about $50. That will provide about 100 samples initially. Once all of the equipment and the uh, reagents are available, it will only cost about five dollars then uh, to run the experiment with about a hundred additional samples. If you have access to a chemistry teacher at your local high school, I guarantee you they have sodium hydroxide and phenolphthalein. Those are very, very common reagents uh, in high school chemistry labs. You could probably acquire them uh, from your uh, colleagues uh, in the high school chemistry uh, uh, class. These are the needed materials. Very simple uh, preparation needed to set up the lesson. Start by labeling the bags with collection site numbers that correspond to the map that you've developed. Just lab label the bags by collection site number. Cut the frozen fillets uh, into smaller pieces. Put one piece in each bag. For the samples that you do not want to show contamination when they're tested. Just seal the bag, you're done. No further prep work is needed. 
for any sample that you want to show contamination, simply add a couple of drops of the sodium hydroxide solution into that bag and then seal the bag. That will allow for a positive contamination test result uh, when the screening test solution uh, is applied. The sample should then be stored at low temperature until the time of experiment. A refrigerator would be fine or a cooler with an ice pack. Uh, you could keep the samples for up to a week, maybe, maybe close to two weeks. I have not kept them uh, much longer than that. I have also prepped samples and frozen them for extended periods of time prior to classroom use. The last step in preparation, uh, setting this up, uh, fill the dropper bottles with the phenolphthalene solution. Each group of students will, uh, will need one dropper bottle for the contamination testing process. Okay, and then quickly, I'll walk you through the classroom experiment once the preparation work is done. Uh, so the lesson uh, unfolds in this manner. Uh, first, you as a teacher should present to the students the map that you've created and the story that goes along with the map. As an example that I shared, we have a creek, a spot where a dump site was discovered, and we're gonna test fish that were caught in that creek for the presence of contamination that may have been coming from that dump site. Present the map and the scenario and then help students to formulate their hypotheses. Students test for the presence of contamination simply by opening their sample bags, adding one or two drops of the phenolphthalein, uh, which is labeled as contamination test solution. Just add a couple of drops uh, into those bags. No color change represents no contamination being detected. A color change represents that contamination was detected. What's actually happening in the simulated experiment is you're using an acid base indicator and testing for pH. The samples that you've added a little bit of base, when you add the pH indicator, it changes color because of the presence of the base. Uh, that color change is immediate, uh, it's obvious, uh, and students interpret that as if the sample was contaminated. They're actually not contaminated. Uh, it's simply an acid base um, test that, that's occurring with the use of an acid base indicator. After they test their samples, simply reseal the bags and the bags can be disposed. Each group of students will only test a few of the samples. Uh, what I do is give um, groups of students a couple samples, uh, but then when all of the sample set has been tested, I ask the students to share their results with one another uh, so that all of the sample set results uh, are available to students uh, to review and then to draw conclusions to pool the results in this manner, uh, simply putting a data table up on a whiteboard and having students fill it in with their results uh, works pretty well. Here's an image showing uh, the test results, what they look like uh, with a little more clarity. Uh, we see here, if the samples are taken out of the bags, uh, you see the sample on the left uh, does not show contamination. The sample on the right does show contamination. Again, it's just because the sample on the right uh, had a little bit of a base added to it. And that base covers the surface of the fish and reacts with the phenolphthalein uh, to form that, that abrupt color change. If you perform the, uh, re the screening test inside the bags, it's much cleaner. Uh, all you do is open the bag, add a drop or two, and then seal the bag. Uh, and we can interpret the results quite quickly. Very simple procedure, it's simulated, it's fake, but if you don't tell students that it's fake, they buy into it. I have delivered this lesson plan many times and I have yet to have students or a class think that it's simulated, that it's fake. They buy into it uh, completely, uh, very engaged, very active, uh, very critically thinking uh, throughout the, the procedure. So here are an example of how to deal with the results. Uh, students could uh, summarize their results in a data table, just recording sample location relative to the contamination result, or what can uh, often be a better, quicker 
representation allowing for drawing conclusions is to record results as a geospatial uh, visualization. And I'll show both examples, um, which can be valuable for students to see uh, and have an introduction to. So if we consider the map with the sample locations, here are the results that I would uh, build into the lesson plan. Here we have samples one through four, which are all downstream. They were found to be contaminated. Samples five through eight, which are all upstream, were found to have no contamination. Okay, those results are very clear cut. Uh, in the sequence of one through eight, the data table is probably enough for students to uh, interpret and draw conclusions. Uh, but just to show you what that would look like as a geospatial representation, we have the map and we just overlay the results on top of the map. Here I have a, uh, an answer key showing the color coding. Red represents contaminated, white represents not contaminated. We see the results in the data table. We see the results in a geospatial visualization. Students could then um, draw conclusions. Do these results support the hypothesis that the location on the map was indeed causing contamination in the watershed? Uh, based on these results, I think the uh, correct response is yes. There's enough evidence to suggest that spot on the map is likely causing the watershed to be contaminated with that specific uh, contaminant. This is a fairly simple approach. Uh, just quickly, I wanna show how this could be uh, very easily tweaked to impart other learning objectives or force students to grapple with, uh, with other issues. Here's a, a quick example. If the collection site numbers are randomized, then it could be a lot more challenging interpreting the results from a data table. Now notice, we have the same map, we have the same number of samples, we have only a difference in the sequencing of site numbers. Uh, so the downstream site numbers now are seven, two, four, and eight. Previously, they were sequenced one, two, three, and four. That made it a lot simpler to interpret. If you wanna challenge your students, randomize the, the site numbers in this manner. I'm gonna show the exact same results we had before represented in the data table. To me, this is much more challenging to interpret even though they're the same results. Looking at the data table has taken me a lot longer to draw conclusions, but if I now overlay the results in a geospatial visualization, we see all the downstream samples are contaminated. This is an example of an experiment where the results being presented in a geospatial manner or one specific visualization can be far, far more effective. Uh, this is a, a simple example that illustrates that. Okay, the last variation I, I wanna share with you about this, uh, this experiment is to tweak the results just slightly. Uh, so I asked before, do these results support the hypothesis? And my answer was yes. All of the downstream were contaminated. None of the upstream were contaminated. What about these results? Just a very, very slight difference in the results. So this lesson plan was tweaked so that not all of the downstream were contaminated and not all of the upstream were contaminated or were, were not contaminated. Do these results support the hypothesis? This has been a fascinating conversation to have with students. And it has occurred to me uh, that, that it, there's a natural misconception that scientific results have to be 100% conclusive or else they are 0% conclusive. Uh, I see that in play right now with respect to mask efficacy. The conversation around do masks work to protect from uh, transmissible, the spread of transmissible disease. I interpret the conversation to suggest many, many people think 
that results have to be 100% to draw a conclusion or else 0%. In this manner where we just tweak the results, uh, I think it's important for students to grapple uh, with this scenario and, and still say, well, most of the downstream samples were contaminated and most of the upstream samples were not contaminated. So these results still support the hypothesis, but with not as much strength or confidence in the results. Um, this is just a, a simple scenario to present students with uh, not clean cut results and challenge them to, uh, to draw conclusions, uh, analyze and think critically uh, about the results and what, what conclusions and what um, confidence in conclusions can, can be drawn. Hopefully this uh, was an interesting idea of a, a simulated lesson that's real time, real space, in person, hands on, and can be structured to uh, result in specific, um, uh, specific data that students are then tasked with analyzing uh, and drawing conclusions on. If you're interested, I have a, a link here uh, in, in this slide to the full lesson plan that was published in the Science Teacher Journal. Uh, this lesson plan was structured with a little more complexity. It was geared uh, more for a high school level. Uh, the watershed map was a little more complex. There were more um, samples collected in the data set. Um, and this is uh, being shared just to give you an idea that this concept allows for uh, endless opportunities for, for complexity. I actually built in a uh, comparison of different species into the samples being tested uh, and randomized the site numbers. So it's not as easy to uh, identify downstream versus upstream when constructing uh, data tables. In general, the observed benefits uh, I have found from this lesson, uh, it appears authentic, students buy into it, and that results in them being uh, very engaged in the lesson plan. It also forces collaboration. If students have to share their test results with other students, knowing that the other students are going to use the results to draw conclusions, uh, they're more diligent in their work. Uh, their work is going to impact others. Uh, so uh, there's a greater degree of collaboration within the classroom uh, from, from my experience. And uh, an observed benefit that I have found is that uh, this type of lesson can allow students to focus on the generalization of results rather than a, a sense of false dichotomy that experimental results uh, have to be 100% supporting a hypothesis or there is no support of a hypothesis. In my mind, that's a false dichotomy in presenting students with uh, data sets that aren't perfect. Uh, can be a very valuable learning experience. Uh, this lesson plan also presents uh, the, the idea of uh, creating new scenarios, just using pH indicators uh, and, and samples such as fish, um, uh, and an idea I had in mind was to construct a forensic uh, crime scene using uh, pH indicators uh, and developing results that will force students to uh, reach uh, or, and draw particular conclusions. Uh, again, if you want the full lesson plan to this experiment, access the uh, National Science Teacher Association journal using the link uh, above. The full lesson plan student handouts uh, and supplemental resources are, are available. We have a little bit of time left today, and I would like to ask you uh, to please connect with your peers. We're going to separate into breakout rooms for uh, just about seven or eight minutes. And what I would like for you to share is if you have used any science simulators or simulated experiments in your classroom, and have had success, uh, please be willing to share those examples with your peers. Um, when we come back to the uh, full breakout room, I'll ask if you're willing to uh, post those resources in the chat uh, so that they're available uh, to anyone who has an interest in, in looking into those additional uh, simulators. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll separate into breakout rooms for, uh, for about seven minutes and then we'll reconvene. 
Uh, see you soon. Uh, hi, everyone. I, I think uh, you have rejoined the main room. I want to thank you for your time today and uh, hope that you have productive conversation uh, with your, your peers in the breakout rooms. I want to reiterate those breakout rooms were not recorded or, or captured uh, in the recording. Um, we're right at 4.30. I want to be respectful of your time, but I also want to ask if, uh, if anyone has questions, comments, or if there are simulation platforms that you use in your classroom, if you would be willing to, uh, to share that uh, just by unmuting or posting in the chat uh, before we wrap up today. Okay, well, I, I'm not seeing anything in the chat or uh, mute coming off, so uh, I'll conclude the session today. Once again, thank you for connecting. I hope you found the lesson plan uh, to be of interest and uh, the overview of the FET simulations uh, also to be, uh, to be of interest. If you have any questions or would like to correspond, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my email is jacob.white at ohio.edu. And uh, you'll receive the slide deck and certificates of attendance uh, within the next few days. Uh, thanks so much. Have a great evening. Uh, happy holidays. And I hope to see you next year. Bye.